This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, hi, everybody. This is Robert, and welcome to today's show. And this is going to be a kind of a special show, right? I hope you uh, had a fantastic Thanksgiving. And for this Thanksgiving weekend, I'm going to be playing a couple of uh, medical history interviews that I recorded in the past. And I uh, hope you enjoy that as much as I love medical history. In the first half, I'm going to play an interview I had with the author of The Great Influenza, John Barry. And we're going to discuss the 1918 influenza pandemic. And in the second half, writer and author Bob Arnebeck. Uh, this is an interview that I did with him some time ago about yellow fever in the United States in the late 18th century going into the 19th century. Really good his, uh, infectious disease history, U.S. history, world history. And I hope you enjoy it. And again, I encourage you to check out the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. For all your news about worms and germs, enjoy the interviews. And this year marks the 100th anniversary of the 1918 influenza pandemic, history's worst epidemic, which accounted for more deaths than World War I and World War II combined. Joining me for a little history about the 1918 outbreak is historian John M. Barry. John is the author of the book, The Great Influenza, and I encourage you to check it out if you never did. It's a good read. Hey, John, and welcome to the show, sir. Uh, Thanks. Glad to be here. Thank you, sir. Now, let's start out with the genesis of this outbreak. What do we really know? You know, where did it start and how long did it last? Well, there are different hypotheses about where it started. Uh, we will probably never really know. It, it could have been in Asia, or it could have been in France, it could have been in Kansas. Uh, it, the all, all influenza viruses have a natural reservoir in birds. They're all bird flu, uh, but the virus mutates as pretty much as rapidly as anything in existence, and that gives it the ability to jump species. Um, so that has happened as far as we look back in history. It will happen as far as we go forward. When a new influenza virus enters the human population, that's when you get a pandemic. Uh, seasonal influenza, the virus mutates rapidly as well, but that's what, and that's why you need a uh, different vaccine every year because the the virus changes, but your immune system still has some uh, ability to recognize it. Uh, and but a new virus is 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 quite different. Will usually spread more explosively, uh, and and may or may not be more lethal than ordinary influenza. Obviously, in 2009 we had a pandemic. Uh, my guess is there were probably many events throughout history just like that that passed without notice because that outbreak was quite mild, even milder than ordinary seasonal influenza. I think we only picked it up because we have modern technologies, molecular biology and so forth, and the ability to to identify the virus. Uh, however, there were also pandemics in 1957 and 1968. They were nothing like 1918, but but they were uh, certainly a lot worse than 2009. And then in 1918, we had the mother of all infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, it probably killed between 50 and 100 million people. And if you adjust for a population, that would be between roughly 225 million to 450 million people in today's world. Uh, obviously, modern medicine is, uh, you know, is light years ahead of the ability of medicine to treat infectious disease back then. So 
many uh, many people's lives would be saved, but it would not solve the problem uh, for a lot of reasons that we could go into. I mean, we are still extremely vulnerable to a severe pandemic. So, uh, John, b- based on the, all the research that you've done, though, as a historian, where do you think it started? Well, I, I advanced a hypothesis in the book that it started in rural Kansas. Uh, but since the book came out, there's been, you know, a lot of scientific investigation of the virus, which suggests that the virus was around before, you know, my hypothesis. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not conclusive. Uh, it doesn't entirely kill the idea of Kansas. But uh, it does weaken that hypothesis. As I said, nobody knows. There are, there are theories that Vietnamese workers crossed North America on their way to World War I, and they brought it. There are theories that it started in a, in a army camp, British Army camp in France in 1915, 1916. Uh, we really don't know. And um, from from start to finish, I mean, as best as you can you can tell me, how long did this pandemic last? Well, the there were some spring 1918 outbreaks that were hit or miss. In fact, it was a lot like 2009. There were some cities where it was somewhat explosive, even in 2009, uh, and there were other cities that. It didn't hit at all. In, in the United States, for example, New York had a very pronounced spring uh, wave. Uh, Los Angeles didn't record a single death in the spring. Uh, you know, but that first spring wave was was not the killer. Uh, partly because it didn't infect as many people. Partly because the uh, case mortality wasn't as high. Uh, the the virus did change, and then in the fall. That was a killing wave. Probably two thirds of all the deaths occurred uh, in probably about 12 weeks uh, between late September and December 1918. And there was a third wave that came uh, January through April in 1919, uh, which was also pretty lethal by any standard except the second wave. Uh, after that, the virus calmed down and became ordinary seasonal influenza. So ballpark 15 months or so? Uh, something like, actually, yeah. almost exactly uh, a year. Okay. All right. Um, John, what was the reaction among the medical community at this time in 1918? Well, you had different – first, you had the research community, uh, which was energized. And, I mean, the scientists back then were, were – quite capable. They didn't have the tools that we have. They didn't have the knowledge base that we have. But they, they were great scientists. Uh, sure. For example, one of the uh, characters in the book, Paul Lewis, had proved that polio was a viral disease uh, back in, I think, 1905, 1906, and then produced a vaccine that was 100% protective of monkeys uh, before 1910. Uh, another scientist, Oswald Avery, uh, continued studying pneumonia after the influenza outbreak. Of course, that's what most people died of, pneumonia, either viral or bacterial. And he ended up discovering that DNA carried the genetic code, which is arguably the most important finding in the biological sciences in the 20th century. Uh, so... But, of course, they also had limitations. Number one, they didn't know what a virus was exactly in, in 1918. Uh, they didn't know if it was a simply a really, really small bacteria and functioned like a bacteria or whether it was a different kind of organism. Uh, there had been a very prominent German scientist named Pfeiffer who thought he had proven the cause of influenza. He was wrong. Uh, it was the, he it named the, the uh, pathogen Bacillus influenza. Name, now it's called Haemophilus influenza, even though it has nothing to do with influenza, but that's a name. 
so you, it was very difficult for them to develop vaccines, and they they did have vaccine technologies back then. Uh, but well, it wasn't difficult; it was impossible because they didn't have the right pathogen. Uh, even today, our ability to develop a good vaccine against influenza is extremely limited uh, because the virus mutates so rapidly. I'm not sure if people realize how relatively ineffective influenza vaccines are. I mean, in the last 15 years or so, they've ranged from 10% effective to 61% effective. Uh, compared to vaccines against other diseases, which are in the high 90s percent effectiveness, it's you know it's a totally different ballpark. Yeah, I think a lot of people are recognizing that shortcoming this year. As a matter of fact, yeah, uh, a lot of publicity about the not a great match uh, this year, which is why. Well, okay, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, sorry. Well, I was just going to say. Uh, it's really why we need to devote resources to a uh, universal vaccine, one that yep. that will work against all influenza viruses. And there has been enough progress towards that to suggest that it can be achieved. But we have not put resources into that pursuit over the last few decades when we should have done it. Yeah, I, I saw that uh, several senators put out a uh, piece of legislation called the Flu, Flu Vaccine Act, basically specifically to, to to take care of that one issue of getting a universal flu vaccine out there. We'll see where it goes. Um, John, this this pandemic occurred during World War One. Um, how did the war affect the pandemic? Well, I don't really think it had a lot of effect on it, uh, other than the public health. Well, I'm, in terms of its spread, I don't think it had the, a lot of an impact. Uh, I think in terms of the public health response, it had a tremendous impact. Uh, because of the war, uh, European nations were censoring the press. In the United States, they didn't technically censor it, but they did, uh, the U.S. government did create a propaganda arm, something called the Committee for Public Information. And at the heart of this was the idea that, and this is a direct quote from the architect of this, the truth or, or falsehood are arbitrary terms. It matters little if something is true or false. All that matters is whether it can move people. Uh, so that was the attitude the government took toward giving people information. And in an effort to keep morale up, uh, bad news was discouraged. Of course, serious illness was bad news. So you had national public health leaders say, this is ordinary influenza by another name. It was known as Spanish flu. I mean, one thing we do know is it did not start in Spain. There was no influenza in Spain until not, until May, long after a lot of outbreaks elsewhere. But Spain was not at war, and its press was writing about the disease at length, and the king got sick. So it, it became known as, as Spanish flu. Anyway, the, you've got national public health leaders saying this is ordinary influenza by another name, and Local public health leaders are are echoing that you have nothing to worry about, don't get scared, so forth and so on. But at the same time, <laughs> excuse me, people are seeing their neighbors or their spouse die sometimes within 24 hours of the first symptom, sometimes with horrific symptoms. Uh, People were turning so dark blue from lack of oxygen. You know, do doctors were saying they couldn't tell uh, black patients from white patients. Uh, some people were bleeding not only from their nose and mouth, but but actually from their ears and even their eyes. Uh, th th these are pretty pretty frightening symptoms. I can't imagine something more frightening. And at the same time, their leadership and the political uh, leaders, as well as public health, are saying, "This is, you know, don't worry about it." Well, pretty soon people stopped listening. You know, they they weren't that stupid. Uh, 
Uh, they knew this was not ordinary influenza by another name. Uh, and it, the fact that they couldn't trust anybody, they couldn't trust their leadership to tell them the truth, it was extremely alienating. I, I think there were, in many parts of, of this country and, and probably in the world, according to the Red Cross, it was a fear akin to the plagues of the Middle Ages. You, you had instances where people were starving to death. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, because nobody would bring them food. Uh, there was plenty of food, but the, the, even even in you know, there are cases where Blaine's his sister wouldn't wouldn't step near the house uh, where the family was ill, and you know that that is very unlike most disasters, uh, where in usually people come together and act heroically and certainly there were some individuals who were heroic and, and doctors and nurses were almost universally heroic they did not as a general rule shrink from uh, trying to help people uh, but it, it was a different it, it would it was I, well, in fact let me give you an example Philadelphia it was one of the largest cities in the country, and uh, there was a doctor there, actually at the time he was a medical student, uh, who was working in an emergency hospital, and every day he drove home to the hospital uh, over 12 miles, and he saw so few cars on the road that he started counting them. And uh, one day in a city, one of the largest cities in the country, in a drive of 12 miles, he did not see one other car on the road. He said the life of the city has almost stopped. Uh, you know, the in, uh, people who stayed home from work and so forth, I mean, absenteeism was extraordinarily high, even in war industries where, where workers were told it was their patriotic duty to go to work. Uh, so, I mean, people were frightened, and, and society began to disintegrate, frankly. Uh, and that's not an overstatement. There is, uh, I, I quoted a guy named Victor Vaughn, who had been the dean of the University of Michigan Medical School, uh, and like many, many others, uh, when the war started, he became a, an officer, and he was the head of the Army's Division of Communicable Diseases. And he uh, commented that, this is a direct quote, if the current rate of acceleration continues for a few more weeks, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth, unquote. And, you know, he was commenting on the uh, disintegration of society, the amount of fear out there. So... It, So, John, um, I want to piggyback on, you were talking a little bit about the public trust in the government. Um, how, how did Woodrow Wilson and the Sedition Act play into all that? Well, they, they're, the law you just cited, uh, and there were actually a couple of laws. One said that uh, or made it punishable by 20 years in prison uh, for criticizing the government. And this was something that was actually enforced. Uh, a congressman was sentenced to 15 years uh, in jail for criticizing the government, a congressman. Uh, there were basically, uh, you know, informers for the J Justice Department who were given badges. There were more than 100,000 of them uh, who were out there reporting any disloyal statements. Uh, so this, in fact, when when a newspaper in Wisconsin uh, started printing the truth about the pandemic and the and the death toll, uh, an army general actually began prosecution of them. Started the process anyway to prosecute them for violating uh, some of these laws. Although that prosecution was dropped as the pandemic proceeded, but that was the attitude toward the truth back then, probably considerably worse than at any other time in our history. 
Yeah, it's very frightening. Um, let me ask you about uh, the actual strain. Um, unlike this flu season, which is you know most devastating on the very young and the and the older, um, this affected mostly young adults. And what made this particular strain so pathogenic? Well, it's still asking that question, and you know we've of course not we. I mean, the scientific community has uh, sequenced the genome and. We can reconstruct it and so forth, and we have some ideas, but we we really don't know exactly. I think the best hypothesis as to why this tended to kill people between 20 and 40, uh, which was probably two-thirds of the deaths were certainly under 65, and, and most of those were between 20 and 40, which is very unlike uh, most influenza outbreaks when 93% of the dead are over 65. Uh, anyway, the most likely hypothesis is that th the immune systems of the young adults uh, are much more robust than for the elderly. And if the virus was in the lung, then the immune system was launching every weapon it had to kill the virus, it, and the battlefield was the lung. Uh, so it was kind of like that Vietnam commander who said we had to destroy the village to save it. Uh, the immune system was destroying the lungs to try to defeat the virus. Uh, so I, I think that is a hypothesis that is the leading one and the one that makes the most sense to me. Right. Um, and let me go ahead and close with this, and I want an opinion from you. Um, John, you, you clearly are an expert in this. How vulnerable are we to a similar pandemic, and what have we learned from the 1918 pandemic? Well, we're extremely vulnerable. Um, as we were discussing earlier, the best vaccine is a 60% effective. It would not be effective against a new pandemic virus. It would take, at this point, at least five or six months to develop a vaccine in, in a best case. And even then, there's no reason to think it would be any more effective than the vaccines that are uh, that we have now against seasonal flu. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, although medical care is infinitely better if you, than it was then, if you have an individual isolated case, you can practically perform miracles. For example, in the 2009 pandemic, in which did hit some people with great severity, uh, you, you had people in ICUs uh, where the blood was actually taken out of their body because their lungs weren't functioning and the blood was oxygenated outside the body and then recirculated uh, until the people's lungs recovered. I mean, they couldn't do anything like that in 1918, but how many beds are there in a hospital where, that's, where you're capable of doing something like that? And what happens when the doctors are sick? What happens when the nurses are sick? What happens with just-in-time inventory systems when you run out of syringes? What happens when you run out of antibiotics? Uh, even today, uh, uh, so when you get a back secondary bacterial infection, uh, pneumonia, following influenza, the case mortality is about 8%. That is a very high number. It's obviously a lot lower than it was in 1918, but 8% is, is, is still frightening. But that's with modern ICUs. That's with antibiotics. When you get a uh, pandemic, it, it hits like a tsunami. You get, it easily could be 30% of the population sick pretty much at the same time, and it simply would overwhelm the healthcare system. And it would, if you get sick very early and you have access to good health care, you're going to have a much better chance of recovery if you get sick a little bit later after all the hospital beds are full, after the antibiotic supplies are gone, and after the doctors and nurses get sick themselves.
Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Is that yellow fever was once a scourge right here in the U.S. And being a bit of a history buff, I thought this would be a really nice segment to go into. To discuss this fascinating piece of medical and U.S. history is, is Bob Arnebeck. He is a retired freelance writer who lives on the Canadian border, <laughs> far from the 80s Egyptian mosquito. Uh, he's researched the 1790s for years, especially the founding of Washington, D.C., and the yellow fever epidemics of that period. His latest book is about the hired slave laborers used to build the Capitol and the White House. He also runs a number of blogs, including the one I found him at, and is very, very good. It's called Yellow Fever Casebook. Hi, Bob, and welcome to the show. Hi, Rick, Bob, uh, Robert. I hope you're doing well. I'm glad you could uh, come on the show. This is a, a very, very interesting topic, and uh, I hope my audience enjoys it. Now, the outbreaks of yellow fever in the late 18th century into the 19th century in the U.S. were a huge and well-documented public health crisis. So let's start out by telling my audience, what years were the outbreaks most notable, and what were the cities that were really affected by it? The big outbreak that people recognized that uh, it was a very serious problem was in 1793 in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And Philadelphia was the largest city in the in the country, about 50,000 people, and about 4,500 people died. Now, we, not necessarily all of yellow fever, but the mortality rates skyrocketed. So you say probably 3,000, 4,000 people died of yellow fever. Uh, it uh, startled the nation. Philadelphia was the capital. The federal government was there. However, the uh, Congress wasn't in session. The President of Washington was rather brave and, and hung on as long as he could, but he, he went on his usual vacation. And there was some worry that they wouldn't get Congress in session because Congress was supposed to return in December. But the cold weather got rid of the yellow fever. Uh, and that being the uh, two factors made it a, a prominent one, it was the, the the, the, the soul of America then, and we were a very cocky nation then. If we think you're cocky today, we were really cocky then. <laughs> we just had the revolution. We just wrote the Constitution. We just got the Bill of Rights through. We thought we were the cat's meow. So having the big epidemic was quite a shock. Then uh, the reaction of the other cities was interesting, which was the complete quarantine both by land and by sea of Philadelphia, especially uh, strict were Baltimore and, and New York City. Uh, and as fate the turn the wheel fate wheel turns in seventeen ninety four, Baltimore had a yellow fever epidemic. New Haven had a yellow fever epidemic. Seventeen ninety five New York City had a yellow fever epidemic. Seventeen ninety seven Philadelphia had a fever a yellow fever epidemic again. Seventeen ninety eight came the mother of all epidemics. It started in, in Philadelphia, but New York City got an epidemic. It went far as north as Newburyport, Massachusetts. Boston had, had an epidemic. Uh, Connecticut had the epidemics. And the cities all along between Baltimore and, uh, and New England had the epidemic. Uh, in 17, and this, this demoralized the nation. And in 1798, the um, equivalent of the State of the Union message was given by John Adams. It was called the annual message then. The first paragraph, the first long discussion was of the yellow fever epidemics. At first, you know, asking the Lord's forgiveness or whatever else was needed to stop this repeated uh, visitation of yellow fever. 1799, uh, Philadelphia had a smaller epidemic, uh, one reason being that people were basically leaving the city. 1798, the, the, the government, of, of, during all the epidemics, whoever could leave tried to leave. But in 1798, the Philadelphia authorities said, okay, let's close the city down. And they built camps outside of the city for the poor people to go to. On the other hand, New York City didn't, didn't keep, uh, kept people, encouraged people to stay in the city, which probably contributed there to mortality. So you can see this is, I mean, this, this was the whole you know, uh, um, this was the lively part of the nation, which 
which was silenced in the, in the falls of, of those years. 1799, it started petering out. 1800, a few uh, visitations. I think New York had its last yellow fever in, in 1822. And then the yellow fever became the scourge of the Mississippi Valley primarily and, mm-hmm. and the southern ports like Charleston, Savannah. And I have the book right here, The Last Epidemic, uh, 1888 in Jacksonville. 430 wow. died. Yeah, me and my wife have taken uh, recent weekend adventures to Savannah and St. Augustine. They both have little mm-hmm. little areas uh, that are kind of like cemeteries dedicated to yellow fever victims. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, but the biggest one in the later 19th century was up the Mississippi Valley. I think there's a movie about that. I can't remember. It's actually um, it's called Yellow Jack oh. about that epidemic. And 5,000 people died in Memphis. It was about equivalent to uh, there's a population of 33,000, 5,000 died. So we're like the equivalent of the 1793 epidemic. Okay, well, let's move on, Bob, from that a little bit. And um, you, you kind of gave some numbers about the number of deaths and all that. And essentially, what, what percentage of the population was affected? Oh, I'd say it's just about 10% which died. Now, the, every, a lot of people got the disease. Um, as you know, like all these viruses, um, it, some people get it lightly and other people get it very, very badly. And the unique, I mean, the, the, the terrifying thing about uh, all the sicknesses are terrifying, but yellow fever was killing people, killing people quickly, killing not the young and the old who people are used to in those days of dying, killing the heads of families, killing teenage boys, killing young men, and, and deaths that, uh, you know, they, People would uh, have this uh, illusion that they were well, or delusion, and then they would get out of their beds. they say, I'm fine, I'm okay. These are the people that walked out and were found dead on the streets. And it was also, people like that could be uncontrollably violent. So the interesting reaction uh, is uh, the use of bleeding, bleeding and purgatives purgatives to, to treat these people. And as we know now, this is the worst kind of medicine. No one bleeds today. No one gives you things to make you barf and have violent diarrhea. But what this did was it got those people in bed and kept them there. So, you know, it was it, it had the advantage of at least controlling the patient because it, it's just a, the, the disease, for whatever reason, attacks the liver and whatnot. But it, mm-hmm. it uh, unleashed this energy in people. Now, I don't know. I, I'm not well enough... In fact, when I wrote all my stuff I did uh, in the 1990s, I, uh, I said, well, how do they treat yellow fever today? So there was a big conference, the Pan American Health Organization conference in Brazil. All the doctors from all the countries just discussed yellow fever treatment, and they went around the table, and no doctor there had ever seen a case of yellow fever. So. Oh, that's interesting, because uh, it, it is still quite common in Brazil. I know it. Yeah. It resurged because it's a, um, as I understand it. Now, maybe further research has, has gone beyond this. It's it's, uh, it's a pool of it in monkey population. Right. So the jungle monkeys will have it, and that will leap out into the urban areas next to the near the jungle areas. So that leaves the question: How did it get up to the east coast of the United States? Yes, and that that's my follow up question here. Yeah, and, so, and the how, best, so how the did yellow fever arrive in the U.S.? At that time, our trade with the West Indies was our major trading partner. At the, at next to England, which, of course, we got all our goods from, but a lot of the raw materials would come up from uh, 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 the West Indies. Cotton, which we think now coming from the south, then was coming from the islands there. Uh, sugar, of course, rum, blah, 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 blah. You know, the, the products. So the... The ships at that time, and we think, talk about the global economy today and how diseases are spread because we're getting shipments of, of uh, you know, boxes from China and stuff like right. that. But these ships of those days, you know, were, were a little uh, a village. You had people, you had cisterns of water, and if, when the ship was being loaded, it just so happened that some uh, mosquitoes were latched onto it, you would have the makings of, of, of an epidemic. So, I mean, no one knows for sure what happened, but uh, uh, there was not only the usual trade with the West Indies, which picked up after the, uh, all the blockades with the, the Revolutionary War. And you sort of picture the American uh, 
history is that during the Revolutionary War, afterwards, we were adjusting our relationships with the world, and we were, you know, didn't know we had any money. We hadn't formed the United States. Once things got in order, our finances and our trade was picking up, picking up, picking up, and a lot of it came from the West Indies. And at the time, 1793, there was the uh, a rebellion, a revolution in Haiti. Uh, the slaves there re rebelled, revolted against the um, Creole and, and French masters. So the French and the Creoles and some of their the slave ser servants fled to the, the east coast of the United States. And uh, so you can say, well, the, the, the yellow fever was brought by Haitian, these people coming from San Domingo, that island. But they could have been from any of the other islands of people coming because uh, Philadelphia did have a number of refugees that year, but so did uh, Charleston, so did Baltimore and other places, and they didn't necessarily get the epidemic. So it's somewhat of a mystery, and uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's the only, you know, it's, there's no, uh, it's the only explanation, I guess, because it, 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 it was cited, I mean, it was spread for so, from Newburyport, Massachusetts, and Boston and whatnot got it, too. Yeah. Now, now, clearly, people of that time had no idea what a virus was. So what were they saying as the explanation of the illness and the source of the illness? What, what, what were people it, it, saying amongst each other? It, it was the obsession then. If you say, if, if talking about diseases there, we have a lot to pick from today, a lot to pick from, but mm -hmm. we're really obsessed with cancer. Uh, then people were obsessed with fevers. Most of the people, they, their family members, the people they knew, but they would, when they said, what did they die of? It was a type, some type of fever. So the, everything was centering on fevers. So yellow fever uh, just became one of the other fevers. And indeed, uh, out of the epidemics, one of the major uh, doctors of the time, Benjamin Rush, who fought the epidemics in Philadelphia, he developed a, th a theory that there was really only one fever and that if the you know, the, there was enough mystic matter, enough sickly air was around. Mm -hmm. You could get a simple fever, the spring intermittence, they called it, and which was like, the, we, we, now it's the spring malaria or the, the type of malaria that's not very deadly. And then if, if, if you could get the remittance, the bilious remittance, and the bilious uh, uh, spring intermittent was you would get the fever every two or three days, and it would go back. You get the chills, the fever, and then you'd be okay. Then you get the remittent, bilious remittent fever, and that would be well, you'd get sick in the stomach, have the barfing and the diarrhea, and and and, uh, and it wouldn't go away. It would just sort of get worse during the day, maybe get better in the morning, but it would remit. It wouldn't be intermittent. It would just go off for a few, uh, depending on the, the time of each day, but you would be sick throughout the day. So yellow fever was generally called uh, bilious remitting yellow fever. So they pinned it into this uh, spectrum of fevers that people experience at the time. And they, of course, they also, they, they recognize that people got smallpox or diphtheria, uh, not diphtheria, but uh, dysentery, which they called flux. So they had names for different fevers describing the symptoms. And of course, so yellow fever would describe the symptom of, of the body turning, of most page, of victims turning yellow. Uh, as for the cause... I mean, they, they had no idea about the mosquito link. No, no, and I've, I've got into that, try to think that through a lot, and and we read the newspapers. What they, what the sexy medicine at the time, or medical research, is. Remember, your French history was Lavoisier, the guy that discovered oxygen and discovered the elements of the air. And in the court of, I guess it was Louis the Sixteenth, and 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 for the French intellectuals, he would have these stunning demonstrations of. Di things dying in front of people's, you know, animals, monkeys, birds, whatnot, dying because of lack of air, bringing them back to life by putting air back into this, you know, concealed uh, uh, bell or, you know, uh, uh, a chamber or something. And uh, then, you know, putting certain parts of air in, uh, and then they were discovering the components of air, the nitrogen, the oxygen and whatnot, and showing that if there was too much oxygen, a person would die. Uh, and so the 
people were fascinated by this discovery and the, the doctors putting these shows on and bringing things, dying, killing things, and then bringing them back to life by manipulating the air. So people uh, forgot. I mean, a, a microscope was, in, was invented a, a century earlier, and people had seen all the little things dancing around in the blood and had been studying it for 100 years, but they just didn't put two and two together, and, and, and then they were snowed by this, this research with... with uh, with uh, but the air, and so a doctor, and, and uh, in those days, doctors could be anything. This guy was also a congressman, uh, Mitchell, and uh, so he decided that the, the yellow fever was caused by what he described, as, but, but other terms as nitrous oxide, laughing gas, was causing yellow fever, which would be, yes. <laughs> be, so you know, would be in modern terms. So anyway, they were fascinated with this. Every every report on the epidemics mentioned the, the number of mosquitoes, but it also mentioned the number of other insects, smells, and whatnot. And they said there were little, there were lots of mosquitoes because the air was bad. If you had bad air, the it, it would the, the things we didn't like would flourish in it, and. Um, you know, so that that's they they uh, they based that that's what the, the reaction to it was to even when they uh, thought of people coming in ships, they blamed the ship. So they invented pumps to clean the air of the ships, uh, and then they of course they quarantined people quarantined people on the ships for fourteen days to make sure they weren't sick and sick, and then they'd pump out the bad air in the ship. And they figured that would, be, you know, uh, keep yellow fever out of the city. And what kept out of yellow fever out of the cities, eventually, no one knows. Uh, they did react and, and um, try to put in water, uh, cleaner water and whatnot. But uh, um, cities never, you can't say American cities ever became healthy places until, uh, until modern medicine and using, uh, you know, screens in your windows and, Right. and things like that. Now, the most severe cases of yellow fever are can be a hemorrhagic fever. So yeah, it, when you start seeing blood coming out of the patient, what, what were physicians at that time doing to treat patients in that kind of condition? Well, Rush had a novel approach saying, nature wants the blood coming out, so I'll take the blood out before nature brings it out. <laughs> so he would, it was called heroic bleeding. And in a sense, he would, as far as I could tell, he would bleed people into comas, and uh, uh, if they could stand it. And so that was his one react. One that, that was one therapy. Um, the other was uh, um, uh, uh, what do they call this? Poultices, you know, blisters. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to uh, well that wouldn't that would they, no one had a no one had a way to stop the hemor hemorrhaging yeah so they just recognized that as a the, the evidence symptoms of inflammation in the body and what they tried to do was uh, this is the word they used which I wish my doctor would use sometime was abstract <laughs> you know, abstract your what's bugging you into something else and then we'll take it out through that so they'd have these blisters that would abstract the inflammation from wherever the inflammation was causing you to be sick it's sort of like the old witch you know witch doctor stuff of you know putting your hands over the head say, i'll take the minute i'll take the illness out of you but no they were they were they, these guys really i shouldn't make fun of those doctors at that time a lot of them died and you can read their letters and, and diaries. A lot of brilliant young men, you know. It, it was it, it because when I would said that the nation was very optimistic then. They really thought they could solve this problem, and they thought they were. And doctors would, you know, they the yellow fever would come. In the old days, yellow any plague, any epidemic would come. The reaction was everybody get out of town. Doctors lead the way. But now, because America was going to solve the world's problems and we were going to respond to these things scientifically and modernly, in a modern way, people, the doctors would come in and, and treat people in the epidemic, and a lot of them died. Uh, Rush 
survive probably because uh, there was earlier epidemics but smaller and it was one in 1762 they probably had the uh you know mild case of yellow fever and that gave him uh, lifetime immunity which he didn't know um so it, the medicine with a major effect of yellow fever on the nation it really didn't stop us in our tracks but it made the medicine for the first half of the 19th century rather harsh. Uh, bleeding was common and, and purging with calomel. <laughs> calomel means it uh, uh, tastes like honey. So it was very sweet-tasting medicine. But the trouble was that uh, your teeth would drop out if you took, took too much of it. <laughs> So Americans got a reputation for having for having no teeth, <laughs> <laughs> and one reason was because of the use of this medicine that got its popularity. It's always been around. It got very popular because of treating yellow fever. Sorry, Bob. Uh, believe it or not, I, I got less than three minutes left. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, time's really flying. Let, let's try. Let me go over a couple more questions and see if I can get some quick answers. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Rush. Who were some other key figures in the battle against yellow fever? Um, boy, he really dominated. He, he was did. Okay. Every every yellow fever epidemic. Sure. Uh, a lot of his competition either died or they didn't. They didn't. Uh, they're trying to think. Uh, that's he's probably the major figure. Right. Each epidemic had heroes. Uh, and the Philadelphia epidemic, the, the mayor Clarkson organized a, a rescuing uh, a rescue situation. Uh, the two black preachers at the time, uh, there was Rush told, had the idea, and other doctors had the idea that uh, African Americans didn't take yellow, didn't get yellow fever. Africans, <clears throat> as slaves from uh, blacks from Africa, may have had immunity, but most of the American-born African Americans then would not have immunity. But a lot of them volunteered as nurses and whatnot in Philadelphia, and, and it was uh, common to use them also in New York. So they were heroes uh, in terms of treating people, and um, no politician stepped up really uh, to because no one had a solution. Uh, and uh, the basic thing that they did, uh, Philadelphia and New York, we came out with uh, try to create municipal water systems, and that was the response. And, and as the, because the epidemics didn't return, you know, that was attributed to one of the uh, that, that was. So in a sense, they became somewhat of a hero, but no one was 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 uh, singled out. Okay, but I got about thirty seconds left. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you one final question. When was the last time yellow fever was seen in the U.S.? Well, uh, I really don't know, but I'm thinking that Jacksonville, uh, 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 my impression is, and you might know better than me, is when after uh, uh, Walter Reed yeah. linked the, the, the mosquito to the, to the disease, they blasted the hell out of mosquitoes yeah. in our country. I th- I th- <laughs> yeah, I think it was about a century ago. Uh, in New Orleans or something like that. But anyway, incredibly informative. I should have dedicated a whole show to this. <laughs> oh, I can, my trouble is I can go on for hours. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I should... Not a problem. Well, thank you, Bob Arnebeck, for all okay. your uh, time and expertise, sir. I appreciate it. And stay healthy down there in Florida. Thank you, sir. All right. Really good stuff there. Really good stuff. Uh, can't get enough of that medical history, you know. It's uh... Anyway, um, again, I want to thank you for listening today and uh, uh, sharing uh, my excitement over medical history and, and some of the things, the wonderful, amazing things that have been done in the past. And on this Thanksgiving weekend, I want to thank my w- loving wife and my family. I want to thank the listeners that uh, listen to the podcast and the radio show and follow it. I want to thank the readers of the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, and uh, encourage you to keep coming back and uh I am most of all, I want to thank the Lord for all the wonderful blessings in my life. And uh, I want to thank the radio station right here. I want to thank uh, Michael for uh, being here every week with me. And I will see you next week And Outbreak News this week. Good night. God bless. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Make sure to join us here next week for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman.